Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Where's your head at? Where's your head at? Paul says in Philippians 3, 7, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them pure rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. That's the heart of the gospel right there. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings becoming like him in his death and so somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already, look at verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Verse 17, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who also live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is their destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Some of you might know our friend Dom Novak who attends the 1130 service. Dom is the owner of Peak Physique here in Greenwich, and he's a world-class trainer. And Dom is on a mission to transform my out-of-shape body into a fit body, and it's killing me. Working with Dom, there are two things that I have learned about physical fitness. First, you can never, ever stop working at it, especially as you get older. It doesn't matter how much you exercised in the past. It doesn't matter how buff you were when you were young. You have to keep moving. Last year, we laid our precious sister, Cora Racanelli, to rest. Cora always used to say to me, Pastor, at my age, I'm afraid if I stop moving, someone will throw dirt over me. <laughs> and Cora did keep moving into her 90s. You can never stop working at it. And, and the second thing I've learned is that training is really more mental than physical. Your body can do a lot more than you think it can. And if you have someone to push you, you'll find that out. As we think about Paul's words in Philippians 3, those are the two takeaways that, that I want you to leave here with today. When it comes to your relationship with Christ, you can never, ever stop working at it. And the battle is more mental than anything. Christian, in your pursuit of Christ, you cannot coast ever. And your mindset is the key to everything. Paul has already said a lot about our mindset in the letter of Philippians. In chapter 2, Paul says, have the same mind. Be of one mind. Uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 3, Paul says, this is how mature Christians ought to think. And if any of us think differently, God will show us. Thinking about that, I have a question from the Lord for you today. Where is your head at right now? In this season of your life, where's your head at? This year, this summer, where's your head at? What is it that you're pursuing? What is it that you're running after? 
What is your focus in life right now? What life goals is it that, that you're pushing toward? Where's your head at? Looking at Paul's words in Philippians 3, I, I want to put three questions to you today. Where's your head at? Three questions from Philippians 3. The first question is this. Where's your head at regarding your Christian priorities? We touched on these verses a little bit last week. Do you think in red ink? It turns out that Paul not only had a PhD in philosophy, he not only was a best-selling author and an itinerant speaker, Paul was also uh, a tradesman who ran businesses in Syria and Turkey and Greece and in Italy. And as a small businessman, Paul knew a little bit about bookkeeping. He knew how to enter credits and debits on a ledger. As a young man, Paul had a mental ledger of credits, his family background, his education, his religion, his experiences, his professional accomplishments, his highly motivated personality. Paul was a mover and a shaker. Paul was a winner, and he was proud of it. But when Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road, his thinking radically changed. Paul began to think in red ink. He uses accounting language to describe the transformation in verse 7. He says, whatever things were gains to me, whatever things were credits to me, I now consider loss, I now consider debits for the sake of Christ. And listen, you must hear this this morning. Paul didn't consider them debits because they were necessarily bad in themselves. There's nothing wrong with loving your family and your people. There's nothing wrong with getting an education. There's nothing wrong with having professional accomplishments or personal accomplishments. But Paul came to consider them as debits because his pride in those things prevented him from pursuing Christ. In fact, Paul says he began to think about all of life in red ink. He goes on in verse 8, what's more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, beloved, listen to me. Paul is not saying that there's nothing noble or virtuous or excellent or beautiful in this life. God made it all. God takes pleasure in it all. And so can we. But what Paul is saying is that all of it is just one great big debit compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. It's like comparing an industrial grade diamond used in a grinding machine with the Hope Diamond. Both, both of them are diamonds, but in comparison to the beauty and the value of the one, the, the other is practically worthless. One is heavily guarded and the other is ground down and thrown away in the garbage. Beloved, Jesus is of such infinite worth. Jesus is of such exquisite beauty. He, he is so surpassingly excellent in every way that by comparison, even the very best that this life has to offer is pure rubbish. And Paul not only started to think in red ink, Paul actually rearranged his entire life to reflect his new Christian priorities. He goes on in verse 8, For Christ's sake, I have lost all things. I have dealt with them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. Paul took out the trash. He purged some things out of his life that were preventing him from fully pursuing Christ. Guess what? He took some things off his calendar. He, he dropped out of some things that were taking away his time with the Lord. He rearranged his weekly schedule to make room to add things that would lead him to know Christ more. At the end of chapter 3, Paul tearfully warns against a very different set of priorities. Paul warns a, a, about some folks who regard themselves as Christians, but really they are unwitting enemies of the cross. 
Their whole life is diametrically opposed to the cross. They live for everything that Christ died for. They live to satisfy their appetites. Paul says their God is their belly. Surely Paul has in mind our sensual appetites, food and drink and partying and sex. But in addition to an appetite for pleasure, we can easily be driven by an appetite for prestige or power or possessions or physical prowess. For some, their appetite is to have that picture-perfect family that everybody envies, enemies of the cross. Not only is their God their belly, but Paul says the things that they're proud of are the very things they should be ashamed of. Their glory is in their shame. You know, I've known men who have been proud of how many sexual conquests they've had. They're proud of how many notches they have in their belt. I've known people who revel in the memories of their exploits while they were drunk or while they were stoned. I've known people who are proud about their comfortable lifestyles and all the toys they've accumulated, though they've neglected their duty to the Lord and his people. Enemies of the cross. Paul says their mind is set on earthly things, not on Christ and his kingdom. They're so preoccupied with the cares of this life that Christ is an afterthought. Christianity is just the general backdrop for their lives, not the express focus. Christ is just one spoke in the wheel of their American dream life rather than being the hub around which everything revolves. That's good preaching right there. You get to listen to that again to hear that. Paul said it this way in Philippians 2. Everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Christ. To the Colossians, Paul wrote, set your minds on things above where Christ dwells in the heavens rather than on earthly things. Jesus rebuked Peter saying, Peter, you mind the things of men, not of God. I want to ask you, this is a little, you know, you're supposed to be nice in the summertime. You're supposed to to preach light, enjoyable sermons in the summertime. I want to be in your face this morning and ask you a pointed question. Where is your head at with regard to your Christian priorities? In this season of your life, this summer of 2017, are your priorities in order? What the rest of the world views as credits, do you consider debits compared to the excellence of knowing Jesus? Is your mental ledger reconciled with the bottom line of Scripture? I'm not asking about your past. I'm not asking about your experiences in the Holy Spirit yesterday or or your service yesterday or your sacrifices yesterday. I'm asking you about right now. I'm not asking about what you hope to do in the future after you've raised your kids and you've laid up your retirement nest egg. I'm asking about right now. Paul says in Philippians 3.15, Christ is the first priority of mature Christians. And if our thinking needs correction, God will be faithful to show us. You know, would you do that in your own private prayer time? Would you ask God to point out if there are some priorities in your life that need to be rearranged? Where's your head at? Three questions from Philippians 3. Your priorities. And number two, where's your head at regarding your Christian prize? Paul talks about his goal and the prize in verse 14. I press on towards the goal to win the prize For which God has called me heavenward. What was Paul's goal? Paul's goal was Christ. Paul's goal was to gain Christ. Paul's goal was to become Christ's possession. And to possess Christ living inside of him. Paul's goal was to become like Christ. In his inner nature. In his moral character, in the attitudes of his heart, in his conduct towards others. Paul's goal was to know Christ as fully as any man on earth could ever know him. 
Talked about these words last week. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. To know Christ in the power of his resurrection means that I experience my own inner spiritual resurrection that comes through believing on him. In that moment of believing, my spirit, which was dead in trespasses and sins, comes alive and I become a spiritual new creation. To know Christ in the power of his resurrection means that I know what it is to live in newness of life, guided moment by moment by the Holy Spirit. It means that I know what it is to experience victory over the generational sins that have plagued my family for decades means that the addiction that has run in my family is broken in my generation. (laughs) Anger and abuse, mental instability. It, it, It means that I know what it is to live in supernatural anointing and authority. To know Christ in the fellowship of his suffering means that I live the crucified life just like Jesus did. Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must take up his cross and follow me. That doesn't mean we're all supposed to die by crucifixion. It means that we're supposed to live laying down our lives to the Lord. This this is what Paul calls us to in Philippians chapter 2. Let this same mindset be in you that was in Christ Jesus. To know Christ in the fellowship of his suffering means to live completely surrendered to God. It means to live in complete humility and service and obedience to God. Paul's goal was to live like this so that at the end of his life he would be found in Christ. Paul's goal was at the end of his life he would finally be completely and permanently united to the one whom he met on the Damascus road. His goal was that he would be permanently and completely united with the one who stood by his bed on several occasions in the darkest hours of his life. His goal was to be completely and permanently united with the one whom he saw many times in dreams and in visions and in spiritual encounters. And here's where we discover that the goal and the prize are the same thing. The goal is Christ, to gain Christ, to know Christ, to be like Christ, to be found in Christ. And the prize is Christ. The prize that we win for pursuing Christ is Christ. The prize is a revelation of Christ that entirely transforms us inside and out. You see, on that great and final day, when we stand before God, we are going to be privileged to receive a revelation of Christ that no other created being has ever had. Do you know, even the seraphim who hover around the throne of God and cry, holy, 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 have to cover their eyes because they are not permitted to look upon the one who is an all-consuming fire and who lives in unapproachable light. But on that day, we are going to see Christ in the full manifestation of his divine glory. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, we will marvel at him. The sight of him will thrill our hearts. The sight of him will dazzle and delight us. The sight of him will fully satisfy us because we have finally looked upon the perfection of beauty and virtue and goodness. Seriously, I'm telling you, when we see him, we will truly then have seen it all and we will never want to look away. And the sight of him will transform us into something that has never yet been seen in all the universe. John wrote, it has not yet appeared 
what we will become. In other words, it has never been seen. No one has, has witnessed it yet. Nothing in all of creation has ever yet seen what is going to happen to us on that moment when we see him. But we know we shall become like him for we shall see him as he is. The sight of him will bring about the perfection of our moral character. Paul said, here on earth I haven't attained. I have not yet been made perfect, but I keep pursuing Christ that I might win that prize. Imagine being impervious to temptation. Uh, imagine being incapable of sinning. Uh, imagine never again bearing the shame of stumbling and grieving the heart of the one who laid down his life for us. The sight of him will bring about a transformation of our physical bodies. Paul said, here on earth, we inhabit lowly bodies, but Jesus will transform them into glorious bodies like his. He's gonna make these out of shape bodies into bodies fit for heaven. Our earthly bodies are demanding, aren't they? What a pest. Constantly need care and attention. I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm thirsty. Our earthly bodies are weak. We wear out quickly. Hate to tell it, Dr. Rana, but you ain't gonna have no work in heaven. You're gonna have to find yourself a new line of work. Our earthly bodies get old, they deteriorate. But Jesus is, is going to transform our bodies. Our glorified bodies will be beautiful in form and appearance. No one has ever seen what they're going to look like. Hasn't been seen yet, but it's going to be good. We'll have limitless energy. We'll enjoy perfect health. Never again will we be sick or injured or in pain. Everything will work the way it's supposed to, and it'll keep on working forever. To win the prize of Christ is to obtain eternal life. You see, Christ is life itself. Jesus said, the Son has life in himself. I am the resurrection. I am life. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. You see, if I am found in Christ, if I am hidden in him and he is inside of me, then I have eternal life because he is life. Paul says with tears that the opposite fate awaits those whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, and whose minds are set on earthly things. Paul says their end is destruction terrifying New Testament word. It, it means eternal judgment. It is the precise opposite of salvation and eternal life. Destruction is a never-ending death. Beloved, can I tell you that a lot of believers today, even some deeply committed believers, don't think biblically about the goal and the prize. When people talk about the glories of heaven, what do they talk about? What do you hear at funerals? What do people always say? They always talk about how great it will be to, to be reunited with their beloved spouse. How great it will be to be reunited with their father and their mother. They talk about being reunited with their pets. They talk about the geography of heaven and the music of heaven. What they don't seem to talk about very much is meeting Jesus. But he is the prize of heaven. We used to sing an old song. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face. All sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Yesterday, Denise and I celebrated our 22nd wedding anniversary. 
Thank you. I got a lot of lovely comments on Facebook like one of you hasn't changed. <laughs> <clears throat> it's awful when we meet people for the first time pe seriously people think like Denise is like 15 or 20 years younger than me but we had a great wedding day Denise and I were studying and we were working in Missouri far away from our home far away from family and friends and so it was great on our wedding day to be reunited with everyone that we loved to, to see friends we hadn't seen in a long time. It, it was a blessing, but I want to tell you that was not the prize of our wedding day. It was great getting, we got lots of beautiful gifts, we got lots of money, that was really great. <laughs> but that wasn't the prize of our wedding day. We went on a beautiful honeymoon in the Virgin Islands, it was great. But that wasn't the prize of our wedding day. The prize of our wedding day was and is Denise. See, my prize was becoming one with her, legally and spiritually and physically. My prize was to belong to her and to have her belong to me for the rest of our lives. Amen. To be truthful with you, the family and the friends and the food and the presents, they were all just a big blur. The only thing I had eyes for on my wedding day was my wife. And that's what it'll be like when you get to heaven. In fact, the Bible compares our life on earth as, as an engagement and the moment we see Christ as a wedding day. Beloved, you listen to me. The moment you get to heaven, you will be so dazzled by Jesus that you will forget to look for your parents for the first 100,000 years. <laughs> Good to see you, Mom and Dad. Thanks for everything. i got to get back to Jesus. Maybe after the first million years, you'll say, wait, I had a dog. <laughs> what was his name? Jack the Mangy Beast? He definitely did not make it to heaven. He's a bad dog. <laughs> and then you'll glance back at Jesus and you'll forget for another million years that you ever had a pet. Beloved, can I ask you another pointed question this morning? Where is your head at regarding your Christian prize? What is the goal of the Christian life for you? Is it to have a happy, clean, living, blessed family? Or is your goal to know Christ as much as any person on earth has ever known him? Is it your goal that your kids would pick up that same passion from you? What are you modeling for them right now? Are you teaching them by your example that soccer is more important than pursuing Jesus? Oh, now I just went and did it. <laughs> uh, it was all good up till there. When it's all said and done, what is the prize that you're pursuing? Do you envision heaven as just some kind of extended life here on earth? Let's kick this party upstairs. Or do you, do you envision heaven as something so surpassing that like Paul, you are willing to let go of everything in life in order to attain it? And it's good right there. Uh, by the way, I, I write every sermon to me for me. I just let you listen in. Maybe the reason there are so many passionless Christians today is because they don't really know what is the prize of pursuing Christ, nor do they know what is the alternative if the prize is missed. I want to gain Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to be like Christ. I want to be found in Christ and so attain to the resurrection of the dead. Where's your head at? Three questions from Philippians 3. Your priorities are your prize. Finally, where's your head at regarding your Christian pursuit? There's two takeaways that I want you to leave with today. First, the Christian life is mostly mental. The battle is mental. It depends on our mindset. It depends on our values. It depends on our disciplined thinking. And second, we can never, ever stop working at it. 
In Philippians 2, Paul already said to us, continuously work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Of course, we can't work for our salvation. We're saved by God's grace alone, but we continue to work on our salvation. Why do we have to keep working on it? Well, Paul gives the simple answer, because none of us has arrived yet. None of us has obtained all of Christ that may be had. None of us has yet become like Christ as much as is possible. None of us know Christ yet as much as he may be, may, may be known. Just so no one is confused, Paul repeats himself twice. Brothers, in, in verse 12, not that I have already attained the goal or have been made perfect. Verse 14, brothers, I haven't taken hold of the prize. Now, I want you to think about this. Besides Peter and John, if anyone had ever arrived, would it not be Paul? Paul called down blindness on Elamis, the sorcerer in Cyprus. He spoke so powerful and he performed such mighty miracles and deliverances that he couldn't stop people from falling down at his feet and worshiping him as a god. He was delivered from prison by a supernatural earthquake. He was stoned and left for dead and miraculously raised up again by the Lord. He was visited by the Lord in person at night. He had dreams and visions and encounters that were so sublime that he was forbidden to speak about them. He had thousands of converts and mentored many spiritual sons and daughters. He sacrificed everything. He suffered so much for the sake of the gospel. And yet he said, I haven't arrived yet. You see, this is the paradox of mature Christianity. The truly mature Christian is the one who knows that he is not yet fully mature. I won't presume to speak for you, but speaking for myself... If Paul hadn't arrived by this point in his life and ministry, I don't suppose that I have arrived either. Would anyone here agree with that? Wait, wait, are you saying I haven't arrived or you haven't arrived? I, I want to be clear. And if we haven't arrived, then it is absolutely incumbent upon us to keep on pursuing the prize of Christ. It's our Christian responsibility to keep on pursuing our relationship with Him. Paul tells us how he pursues. First of all, he pursues with fierce determination. From accounting language, Paul changes to military language. He says, I press to take hold. Those two words to de describe an army pursuing an enemy and capturing that enemy. And if an army is in pursuit, it doesn't stop until it overtakes. And when it overtakes, it captures and it doesn't let go. In fact, Paul uses the very same word that he used in, in verse 6 to describe how he once pursued the church. With the same ferocity that Paul once pursued the church, he is now pursuing Christ. He said, he grabbed me on the Damascus road, so I'm going to grab a hold of him and I'm never letting go. Jesus talks about that kind of militant determination. He said, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent, the violent take it by force. Ooh, we better go back to the gospels. Been in Paul too long. Beloved, Jesus wasn't talking about earthly warfare. He was talking about the fierce determination to lay hold of him and never let him go. Jesus is talking about the fierce determination of the four buddies who, who brought the crippled man to Jesus. And when they couldn't get near the front door, they found a back staircase and they tore a hole in the roof to get to Jesus. He's talking about the fierce determination of a pleading father on his knees in front of Jesus and a bleeding woman who pushed her way through the crowd so she could touch the hem of his garment. He's talking about the fierce determination of a Syrophoenician woman who refused to take no for an answer and matched wits with Jesus. Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. 
He's talking about the fierce determination of a blind man who shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And when they told him to be quiet, he shouted louder. He's talking about Jacob who wrestled with the Lord all night by the brook Jabbok and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Beloved, listen to me this morning. When was the last time that you felt that kind of fierce determination in your spirit to take hold of the one who has taken hold of you? When was the last time that the stomach of your inner man growled with spiritual hunger? David said, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. My soul thirsts for you. In a dry land, there's one thing that I've desired of the Lord, and that will I go after, that I might dwell in his house and behold his beauty. When was the last time that you were so desperate for his presence that you would travel anywhere at any time with anyone if you thought he'd meet you there? When was the last time you couldn't wait to get to worship? When was the last time you couldn't wait to get your responsibilities out of the way so you had some quiet time to fellowship with him in his word and in prayer? I have to tell you the truth. Every week I can't wait. I I have building and I have people and I have staff and I have all these. I I can't wait. I can't wait until all the other pastoral duties are, are, are done so that I can get to the Word and I can fellowship with Him. Such sweet times of fellowship, pouring over the Word of God and spending time in prayer. When was the last time you said, I, I can't wait, Jesus, till, till this work is done so I can be in your presence? Paul tells us how he pursues with fierce determination and with forward focus. From accounting language to military language, Paul changes his metaphors one more time to a running race. I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it, but this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. Paul's language describes the finish to a running race. Every runner knows that In the final few meters of a race, you must never, ever look back. To look back is to break your focus on the finish line. To look back is to to break your rhythm and to break your stride. To look back is to break your confidence. On August 7th, 1954, the greatest mile matchup ever was run. It was during the British Empire Games in Vancouver. Roger Bannister from England and John Lundy from Australia were the only two men at that point who had ever run a mile in less than four minutes. And they were matched up in a head-to-head race. Bannister had gone into the race with a strategy of slowing his pace in the third lap in order to save energy for the final kick. But in the third lap, John Lundy roared past him and he opened up a big lead. Bannister poured it on and almost got the gap closed. And then came a moment that is known all over the running world. Near the finish line, Lundy couldn't hear Bannister's footsteps behind him, so he turned his head back. And when he turned his head, he had a fatal loss of concentration. Bannister surged ahead, and he won the race by five yards. That moment has been immortalized in photos and paintings. There's even a statue of it. If you want to win the prize, don't look back. Paul says, this one thing I do, I don't look back. I keep a forward focus. Now, what was it that Paul refused to look back on? I'll give you this and we're done. What Paul refused to look back on was all the spiritual experiences of his past. What he refused to look back on was all of his successes, 
all of his sacrifices, not that they weren't good, but Paul refused to look back and revel in those old glory days and so give himself permission to coast for a while. Now, you know, I've done a lot. I've seen a lot. I've experienced a lot. I've served a lot. I'm sure the Lord would understand if I just coast a little bit. I'm sure he knows how busy I am. I'm sure he knows what I need to accomplish in this season. So I, I, I'll just let, let the, the fuel from, from the past experiences carry me. Yeah, remember that revival in Antioch that was so powerful that they stopped calling us the way and started calling us little Christs, Christians. Remember the look on the Philippian jailer's face? after the earthquake and he fell on his knees and says, what must I do to be saved? Remember when the Holy Spirit fell on the new believers in Ephesus. Remember when Jesus stood by my bed and said, stay here in Corinth, Paul. I I have a great harvest for you. Remember when Eutychus fell out of the window (laughs) and he raised from the dead again. Paul refused to to look back on all those successes and experiences in a way that would cause him to break the rhythm of his relentless pursuit of Christ now. To look back is to lose ground. Paul says in verse 16, let's keep pace with what we have already attained. Let's not break our rhythm. Let's not break our stride. Let's not break our focus by looking back. So let me ask you one final pointed question this morning. Where's your head at regarding your Christian pursuit? Is it possible that like John Lundy, you're looking back? Is it possible that there's been a break in your stride, that that your focus has been distracted rather, rather than running hard after Christ right now in this season? Is it possible that you've given yourself permission to coast? It's okay if I concentrate on other things. It's okay. I've been water baptized and fire baptized. I was slain in the spirit 10 times during the Greenwich outpouring. It's all right. Can you say with Paul that there's a fierce determination in your spirit right now to grab hold of the one who grabbed hold of you? In closing, I want to appeal to everyone here at Harvest Time. As we get ready to move into our new sanctuary this fall, let's corporately do this one thing from Philippians 3.14. Corporately, let's forget what's behind us and let's run with forward focus. Beloved, please, somebody listen to me. You need to hear this today. Forget the glory days. Forget the glory days of the Civic Center. Forget the glory days in phase one. Forget the glory days when we enjoyed the fellowship of some friends who aren't here anymore. Forget the glory days of this or that staff member or this or that visiting evangelist. Forget the glory days of this or that missions trip. Forget the glory days of the dome. If you want to know the truth, it was cold in the winter, it was hot in the summer, and it was noisy all the time. Let's forget the glory days of the Greenwich outpouring. It's part of our story. They're precious memories, but let's not get stuck there. Let's look forward to what God has for us yet. Let's press forward to the goal of knowing him more than we have ever known him. Let's press forward to the goal of experiencing more of his presence than we have ever experienced. Let's press forward to the goal of being like Jesus more than we ever have. Where's your head at? Three questions from Philippians 3. Your priorities, your prize, and your pursuit. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus... A great big praise in this place today.